evening. Welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Of course, BS stands for Building Science. Uh, tonight, we're, dis we're discussing hot water distribution, or more specifically, distributing hot water quickly and efficiently. Uh, of course, I want to introduce myself. I'm Travis Brungard. I'm in Prairie Village, Kansas, uh, running Catalyst Construction, where we build high-performance homes and do some custom renovation. Tonight, I'm drinking water from my truck. No drinking and driving, friends. Uh, very responsible, but soon, soon I will be drinking, as soon as I arrive in my uh, proper destination. Now, BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and, of course, this, our Zoom show. The Brew Crew and our guests volunteer our time each month to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. I know Gary's going to bring that tonight. Now, I encourage you to start your own BS and Beer group uh, locally, and for information on how you can get that done, go to thebsandbeershow.com and, of course, check out the uh, December 22 show. Um, you can find a chat box icon at the bottom of the screen. You want to post your questions and comments there and be sure to click all panelists and attendees or everyone because otherwise zoom wants to default back to panelists only and then no one gets to see what you're saying um, this video recording of tonight's show will be available at green building advisor and of course all past shows can be found there and also on youtube through a link at the bs and beer show.com so uh thanks always to our partners at green building advisor and of course fine home building magazine and with that i kick it over to ben for announcements Thanks, Travis. Uh, so I'm Ben Bogey. I'm production manager and principal for BPC Green Builders in Connecticut. Uh, this evening, I'm drinking, uh, let's see if I can do it, uh, a Blurry Wishes from Cantina Brewing, which is the brother of one of our project managers. So drinking from the family this evening. Um, some quick announcements. Uh, coming up on November 15th, Armando Cobo's Dallas-Fort Worth Building Science Day is coming up. We'll drop links to all of this in the chat box. Armando has been a longtime supporter of us and Green Building Advisor is an excellent font of knowledge around building and building science. I suggest if you're in the area, you make the time to get to that. Uh, similarly, uh, just before that is going to be FiusCon uh, for Passive House US happening in Houston, Texas, November 7th to 10th. Sadly, I'll be missing it this year, but uh, I'm sure it is going to be jam packed full of incredible knowledge sharing. Uh, coming up is Taunton Sustainable Home Building Accelerator, a.k.a. Emily's Pretty Good House Training Course. It's open for enrollment through November 12th with a pretty significant discount. So don't miss your shot. And we also want to throw out a little teaser coming up on December 7th. We're going to have Mr. Building Science himself, Dr. Joe Stebrick, with us for a Building Science Christmas Carol, Spirits of Building Science Past, Present, and Yet to Come. How building science is transformed into a kinder, gentler field. And there's an unconfirmed rumor that he may be in a Santa outfit. So don't miss out on that one. So that's December 7th. With those uh, happy announcements, I kick it over to Mike for our introductions. Thank you, Ben. I'm Mike Maines. I'm a designer in Maine. I need better lighting. My lighting is really terrible tonight. Uh, I am drinking a kombucha store bought local or it's just a store-bought kombucha but it's uh tasty um our guest tonight is expert our, our guest expert tonight is gary klein president of gary klein and associates he has been intimately involved in energy efficiency and renewable energy since 1974 one fifth of his career was spent in the kingdom of lesotho and the rest in the united states curious about that story uh he has a passion for hot water getting into it getting out of it and del efficiently delivering it to meet customers needs after serving 19 years with the california energy commission gary has provided consulting on sustainability since 2008 he received a ba from cornell in 1975 with a major in technology and society and an emphasis on energy conservation and renewable energy gary is there Anything else you'd like to tell us about yourself? What's your beverage of choice this evening? Uh, right now, I'm not drinking. I still have things yet I have to do. So we'll yep. just wait and see. Sounds sounds um, good. Or so, so you asked you asked about Lesotho. If you yes. want to get started, I'll give a short version of that. Yeah. You should ask me how did you go to Lesotho, Gary? Yes, yes. How did you go to Lesotho? That's how you pronounce it, Lesotho. Yes. Okay. How I answered the phone. You I got a phone have... call. <laughs> You know, got to go somehow. So yeah. when I graduated college, I couldn't figure out who'd hire me. So my buddy and I, Alan Wyatt, set up a consulting firm when we were right out of college. We got to stay in Ithaca, New York. It was inexpensive. We were still sharing houses. So, you know, everything seemed good. Um, uh, one day, Alan gets a call from our buddy, Jack, who'd gone back to work in Canada for the Canadian government, 
Alan, they need someone to go to Lesotho to do wind energy research. Can you go? He says, sure, where's Lesotho? Um, you have to remember, this is 1977. There's no Google to look up things. There's no map things. On the, you, know, you can't do that. You have to have a, this thing called an atlas of the world. Give me a break, right? Um, and so we, we figured out it was one of two countries without a map in the room. And a year and a half later, Alan goes to Lesotho for three months of energy consulting. He's gone a month. He calls me. And he says, they don't need me. They, me, they need you. Can you come? I said, sure. He says, what about your full-time job, which I had moved to when he left for Lesotho? I said, well, I've only been here a month. If they don't give me a leave of absence, I think I'll quit. Um, I, I did get a leave of absence that went on for about four years before we mutually agreed it was time to give up on that, not that, that, that experience. Um, and I went to Lesotho for six months. I stayed seven years. <laughs> um, and I started out doing energy research, converting biomass energy uses to solar energy uses, because unlike Syracuse, which has 330 cloudy days of the year, Lesotho has exactly the opposite, 330 clear days a year. And it's almost a perfect solar climate for doing passive solar related things. I installed my first solar panel, water heating panel in 1974, and my first PV panel in 1979. I've been doing what we do for a while. Wow. Now, while I was in Lesotho, um, I got the chance to build a, a I converted a rondobble, which is a roundhouse with a thatch roof, a stone walls, thatch roof uh, to a solarized rondobble. So it was warmer in the winter than all my neighbors were. And then a few years later, I got to build a home in, in the capital, Maseru, um, which was off grid at the time we built it, um, that has never had mechanical heating or cooling. And it has been comfortable ever since the day we built it. I did most of the things we talk about being hard to do for uh, lead construction or passive house level of construction. I did most of that with what was available to me at the time in 1981. Um, continuous insulation and the footings and the, and, the, and the walls. We know how hard that is to do. We did it back then. We built our own dual pane windows on site. We used the clay that came out of our foundations and our drainage trenches uh, to make bricks, which were made by my neighbor 100 yards away. So he wheelbarrowed the, the clay over and wheelbarrowed back the bricks. Um, it was pretty cool. And we did all of this in 1981. Mm. Um, I get to see that house this coming Christmas. I'm going to go back to Africa for a short visit and I'll get to see how it's doing. And it's, what are we, over 40 years now. Wow. Mark Rosenbaum oh, made a comment to me uh, at Nessie earlier this year. He said, you know why I get to charge so much money for consulting? Because I know where the book is. <laughs> and the point is, is that a lot of this stuff has been figured out for a long time, you know, largely at least by the 40s or 50s and written down. Just people forget that they can look at books or find the books and learn about these things. So a lot of the stuff that we think is brand new is, you know, pretty well proven tech. Uh, yeah. what can you what can you tell us about hot water gary i'm in it <laughs> the end what you asked um so or why, let's why talk you, about what what do you want to know about hot water or, um, why do people run out my, what do they first, care about what would you like to know oh yeah or, or, or my first question is 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 really or why does it matter um, our, our, our subtitle is or is distributing it efficiently and quickly. Um, why why do we care if it's distributed efficiently and quickly? Like in the Northeast, especially, we have an abundance of water. We don't have the droughts um, you've had out west. Or why should we care? Why does it matter? It's a great question. So why don't we dis discuss briefly how I got into working on hot water as a system? because that tells the story of what I've learned customers want. One day, about 30 years ago, I was working for the California Energy Commission and I received a call from someone who was talking about solving a problem of waiting for hot water to arrive. Um, and I was working on space conditioning, right? Which is what building science is generally all about. And I was one of the folks nationally going around and teaching how to analyze buildings and look at the stuff in construction and 
then go back and check what happened with blower doors and infrared cameras so you could learn how to see what you saw at the end in the beginning so you wouldn't have it at the end. We are doing that, and that's what I was doing as part of my work. So he calls and asks, how long does it take to get hot water from the water heater to the furthest fixture in your house? So I'm going to ask everyone on the call to put that in the chat. How long does it take to get hot water from the water heater to the furthest fixture in your house after you turn on the tap? And while they're doing that, I'll continue to tell the story, and then we'll see what everyone responds. Um, so I was working on you know, space conditioning, which was the biggest energy use in residential applications back in the early 1990s. Um, and I decided that, you know, I'm a pretty simple guy. You work on the big problems, work your way down the list, right? Water heating was the second biggest. So I was willing to listen about it, but I wasn't willing to do anything at the time. He calls me back every month for a year. And every time he calls back, he explains to me something that my wife and I are likely doing to accommodate the weight. Because it was a while, it took a long time. I had time to turn on the shower. These are all two-handled shower valves, so it's all hot. It's not like this mix thing. I turn on the shower and go to the kitchen and make coffee. Now, I didn't brew, you know, I didn't grind the beans. They were already done. I was just like, put it in the, the maker and make the stuff, and I come back. And sometimes I'd come back, and steam is billowing out of my shower stall. When did the hot water get there? I don't know. It beat me. Steam takes a long time, right? So... Anyway, in the evenings, my wife would um, get ready for bed and she'd turn on the sink uh, so she could have hot water to, to wash up with. And I could hear her walking around the house. I could hear the, you know, the, the, the doors in the kitchen. I could hear the living room. I could hear the bedrooms about halfway back. Halfway, she's working her way back to the bedroom. About halfway, the steam's spilling out of the sink. So I get out of bed and turn it off. She comes back, sees it's turned off, turns it on and goes back again. We were doing the craziest things to wait. And I'm sure everybody has some version of a, a pattern that they can share about what they do to accommodate the weight. We've developed routines because we learn it takes a while and we're not standing there doing this for two minutes. Okay. Finally, to make him go away, I got up one Saturday morning and I stood there with a bucket and a stopwatch and I found that it took four gallons and four minutes till hot water got to the shower in our house. Now, we didn't live in a very big house. We lived in a 1,600 square foot slab on grade home built in 1978, which was a U.S. median home the year it was built. It was the first year that Title 24 in California had energy standards in it. And based on infrared knowledge taken while I lived in the house, there was only one bat missing in the walls with insulation. I think that's pretty darn good. Uh, none in the attic, none in the ceiling. It was great. They, given the time frame, they did a great job, right? Um, actually, I think they did better than we do today. It was simpler construction. So anyway, all good. So it was not a very big house. And I had a one gallon per minute shower head that was satisfying. It was actually a pretty strong spray. I actually like to know I'm in the shower. I want to feel it on my back and I got to get warm. It, it, these are important things, right? Um, all right, all's well and good. So if I have one gallon per minute, and I have four minutes, I've got four gallons, right? That's what I measured. So what's wrong? Well, I could see the pipes right above the insulation in the attic because back in those days, they only required R19, six inch bottom cord to the truss. Guess what? R19 fills it, the pipes run right on top of it, no drilling. Great, uninsulated, of course. Um, I could see the pipes. There was less than two gallons of cold water sitting in the pipe when I turned on the shower. Now, you explain to me why four gallons came out before hot water arrived. I couldn't do it. From first principles, I just couldn't figure out why there was double the waste. If it had been 10, 15, 25%, I wouldn't be here today. It wouldn't have been a problem that's not fundamentally interesting. Double just sounded wrong. So I called all my friends around the country and asked them how long did it take in their houses? Don't wait a year to get back to me. And I learned very quickly it was getting worse not better as houses got newer. And I knew we were on to a new part of building science. Someone had to start paying attention to hot water as a system. And that's what got me started. So I see we have lots of answers here. Um, Anywhere and... between 15 seconds and I think three minutes, maybe there was a four minute comment in there. 
I like this 3.2 minutes. I want to know who measured that. <laughs> uh, there's an 18 minutes. That's concerning. Whoa. What's the story there? 18 minutes. Are we sure it's eight? So 18 minutes, it's Is either really, really hot. <laughs> I don't know, Mark. <laughs> 18 minutes involves a visit to someone else's house with a bucket is I think how that works. Actually, I've heard of it in apartment buildings without research. So they have big pipe because they're serving lots of apartments and they live at the far end of the complex and there's no circulation loop and it takes a while. I had one woman in class tell me she used to turn on the tap and go back to bed for 20 minutes. So stuff like this happens. Um, so it varies all over the map and very few are under 30 seconds. Ooh, one second per foot. I like that answer. <laughs> Two seconds. Two seconds mean you've you've got to have hot water very, very close, recirc loop or water very close to the water, so fixtures very close to the water heater. Um, both of those are obvious good answers to the question of how to solve the problem. Um, but it's all over the map. I see one with tankless. Um, and on tankless, you actually have to wait for the water heater to warm up before it ships hot water out if it's a straight tankless. Some of the tankless have small tanks built into them. And if they're full of hot water, then it's whatever the volume in the pipe is. But if they're waiting to turn on and ramp up, um, it takes a while. So all of this is pretty typical. And that's what I was learning back then. So we got together some years later. Um, six of us got together for dinner after the IBS show one year in Vegas. I think it was 2003. And we asked ourselves a question. If you could do it, how would you deliver hot water to every fixture in any house waiting no more than uh, one cup before the hot water arrived? So how would you do it? You can, all can put answers in the chat. We'll look and see what people do. Turns out there are only five ways that we have ever found. Mount the faucet to the top of the hot water heater. Okay, but you got all the faucets to do that. Lots of hot water heaters. Oh, so you, you, you've, you've got two answers. One is to put all fixtures really close to one water heater, and the other is to put a water heater at every fixture. <laughs> I'd like to hope in a prayer. Um, <laughs> small pipes under high pressure, create a water loop. This is great. Um, cool. So we asked the question about no more than wasting no more than a cup because a cup is a really small defined amount of water, right? And if you could do it within a cup, that would be pretty exciting. It's not very much water. We agreed to get together um, shortly after the, the, the dinner. And yes, that's 250 milliliters, Alice, and I get that. Um, we got agreed to get together and test our theory of the best way that we thought that the way we thought was most buildable to accomplish the answer. So it turns out the five ways are as follows. Uh, ben, you got the you got two of the first of the five. One water heater close to every fixture, one water heater for every fixture. Those are the opposite extremes, if you will. There's one in the middle of that is to put a water heaters near each cluster of plumbing. So you could have a cluster over here because you've got a stretched out house and there's a water heater near that cluster and there's another one over on the other side of the house. I've seen that in some ranches with basements where the owner knew that that was what was going to happen and they put a water heater at each end of the house and that's where the fixtures were. Okay, the middle were dry rooms and the ends were wet rooms. Okay, that makes reasonable sense, right? Um, that's three of the five ways. The fourth way we came up with was that that night was was putting in a circulation loop close to every fixture, which it would, you know, it's buildable. You can not worry about the layout of the, the floor plan, which is the architect's job and the plumber and plumbing engineers get involved and say, well, we got to go from here to here to here. We'll just connect them all, but we'll do it with a loop. And so the question then we wanted to wrestle with was how much energy is attached to keeping the loop warm in advance of hot water use, right? There's an energy question, but the first question we asked was about water, not about the energy consequences of doing it. Mind you, we haven't discussed the energy consequences of having multiple water heaters either, right? Or the costs or the installation. There's a whole bunch of other things to do in the comparison. And the fifth method, which is electric heat trace on the, on the supply piping, um, 
I, we didn't know about it at the time, but some guy comes up to me at a conference a couple months later and says, you forgot us. Like, okay. And he told us what it was and he traces the fifth method. We've never found other ways. I see in the chat, reducing diameter of pipe. Um, Michael Chandler, I'll remember to talk about that in a little bit. He's got an interesting part of our story. Um, and the, the, the question is volume. If you want to waste no more than a cup, this is the logic problem. What is the maximum volume of water that can be in the pipe that's not hot? Half a cup? Yeah, we didn't know that then. We knew it had to be less than a cup. That's the absolute maximum, right? Um, and you might be able to do it if a cup, if the other end of the, if the pipe was already hot, but not hot enough, right? You'd clear out the volume oh, and it'd sorry. be hot oh, almost can you immediately. Explain that? Can you explain or, or explain a little more about why is it a cup and half a cup? I missed, I missed a little bit there. So remember the experiment I ran in my house. Mm -hmm. I found that it took roughly twice as much water as was in the pipe before water hot enough to shower in came out the other end. Okay. And we'll call that 105, 110 degrees. I don't do cold showers willingly. If I did, I wouldn't have to wait for it to get from the water heat. I'd just get in, right? It's cold yeah. shower. I don't care. Um, but if I want to have hot water get there hot enough to shower in, um, we have to wait for it to get through the pipe. And it turns out that based on some research that Carl Hiller did after we ran our experiments, uh, we, as I said, we got together to run a couple of days of experimentation. We learned that we could get hot water within a cup if we worked at it. Two cups was a much more buildable number, by the way, than one cup. But we, we got that. And what Carl taught us from his research is that it takes roughly one and a half to two and a half times the volume of water that's in a pipe before hot water comes out the other end of it. He did that experiment a thousand times for the research he did for the Energy Commission in California. Um, he's published that in more than one place. And we've been teaching it ever since we learned it, which was 20 years ago. Right. And so you get to pick the volume. Well, you get to you get to pick the waste of time and you convert that into volume based on the diameter you can build. So some people get to use three eighths. Most of the world in plumbing in the U.S. wants minimum half inch pipe or the, the pipe that serves a, a fixture, either hot or cold water. Um, some jurisdictions allow uh, three eighths tubing. Um, and I know Allison has done this and so has Larry Weingarten out here in California. They've actually built some housing where they're using quarter inch tubing. And the benefit is you get more length for the same volume because the inside diameters are smaller. As long as you match the inside diameters to reasonable velocities for the fixtures you're attached to, the physics will say it'll work and you should be able to do it. That's not always what happens in construction, but that's what the science says. Um, and Lou's put a comment and he's got to leave, but some of this stuff made it into the book that Lou did with uh, George Kurtzen uh, out here in California on the, the habitat homes, which incredibly good work George did. He actually did two things. The single biggest thing that George did is he was able to reduce the distance from the water heater to the furthest fixtures, such that it went from 80 feet, pretty much what my house was, same size house, um, down to the furthest fixture was 10 feet of plumbing away. Okay. That's pretty darn good. Um, yes, and as Allison points out, the hot water rectangle is less than 1%. That's a metric we use to talk about all the spatial relationships. So the volume matters and you can design it. And the question I have for you is how many architects are giving us floor plans where the rectangle that bounds the water heater and the furthest and the fixtures is less than 10% of the floor area? I can count them on one hand and have a lot of fingers left over. Um, right? Mike gave and me Allison, one once. Yeah, it once, right? It doesn't happen very often. Or, um, or, it, or it, it was partly a coincidence, but yeah. 
We'll we'll take it though. We'll sure, take it. Sure. Right. And so and I don't care whether the building's one story or two stories or three or four, it doesn't matter. The rectangle proportionally gets smaller because there's height, not length. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to suggest to you that distance is a problem for the plumbing, right? The architect lays out a floor plan and puts all the wet rooms wherever it seems useful to put them for the use and patterns of the house. No, I like that idea. I want houses to work well, all right? And then when the plumber gets looks at it, he says, well, like, I have to connect them all. They can't have any leaks, right? And so we're sort of stuck with distance, so I'm going to guess that some of you are sitting in a room that's about 10 by 12, an office, office size bedroom, bedroom size office, you name it, a cube, whatever it is. Put a water heater in one corner over there and put a diagonally op fixture in the diagonally opposite corner. How many feet of pipe does it take to get from one to the other? 15. You cannot. How many? Like 15. 15. Mm, you can't do the limbo under the pipe. Ain't going to happen. It's probably going to follow rectilinear dimensions, it's going to follow the edge of the space because that's where the spaces are to put the plumbing. And so you've got 10 plus 12 plus vertical to get across one small room. It's close to 30 feet. It's a long way. Okay. And we only went across one room. Give me a break, right? So if you have basements or crawl spaces, I recommend plumbing up from the basements to the first floor or the crawl space to the first floor. If you have two stories, I recommend plumbing from below to the second floor as well, right? One story up. And if you have slab on grade or you have plumbing in your basement, then you want to plumb from the ceiling down because you really don't want supply pipes under the slab. It's not a good, good place to put them if things break and they tend to do that over 50 years, right? it adds up to be a problem. So we want to bring plumb down. That will give us the shortest practical distances to get from a recirc loop in the ceiling down to the fixtures at the first, the, the basement of the, up below, above the slab and up to the fixtures on the second floor, or the first floor, depending on how you look at it. Does that all make sense? All right, how tall are you? Ben, how tall are you? Mike? 5'10". Me too. Six feet, yeah. So we're all about the height of one cup of water and half inch plumbing. I use half inch for this discussion because it's the minimum diameter in most plumbing codes. It's the most typically used pipe dimension for what I call twigs. And so you wanna keep the twig short. My usual rule on a job site is who's the shortest person on the job? They'll always find somebody. Um, and if they find, you know, I say whoever it is, no more than twice their height. That's the longest twig. It's a good, simple rule. Everybody remembers it. If you can do one twig, great. It's great. Sometimes you can't. In California, where we do a lot of slab on grade construction, um, the first floor is really hard to do unless you allow that extra length. Now, if you're allowed to use three-eighths tubing, you'll cut the volume in half, but um, <clears throat> you won't. You know, you still need the length to get from point A to point B. Um, oh, good. You got the hot water rectangle. I'm glad that got written up. I didn't remember that. That's good. So, or, or, or it's it's an article Allison Bills Bills wrote. It's good. Um, or Gary, just quickly, could you? Or I've I've heard you before describe. You know. You know, trunk and twig versus versus trunk and branch, but I forget what the differentiation. Like trunk and branch is 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 a more common or analogy. Why do you call Term it a twig? Well, yes, because branches have twigs on them. Okay. So there's trunks that are the main line coming in from the building or from the water heater down the center of the house, the spine, if you will. There's branches that go to bathrooms, and twigs serve the sinks and the showers. And so I'm interested in the volume from the source to the use. And in my designs for plumbing, I tend to recommend running the recirc loop closer to the fixtures rather than having branches that go to the bathroom so that the twigs to each sink or shower are as short as possible. The volume is as short as possible. That's the general way of doing it. Um, so... I mentioned that um, I saw Chandler 
uh, Michael Chandler on. Um, Michael came up to Larry Weingarten and I at a building conference. Good Lord, Michael, it must be 15 years or so ago. I don't have the exact date in my mind. Maybe you'll remind me. Um, and showed us a book that he that his great grandfather had written. Well, if we look at the publication date, it's 1941. And it's a study on the pressure losses through pipe and fittings. But his great grandfather did the research in 1892, and it was for steel pipe and threaded and flange fittings. And it turns out that that book created a table that's still in use today by everyone who does plumbing design. That 1941 publication got adapted into the plumbing codes. It got you uh, picked up by the Hydraulic Institute. And it's been published since at least 1960 in their documents. And it is the basis of design for all plumbing systems in the US and Canada and other places. It's the only research we've ever found. It's for steel pipe and threaded and flange fittings. When's the last time you put, by the way, I didn't say galvanize, I said steel. We don't use steel pipe for plumbing in our homes because it rusts. So, right, I mean, we just don't use it. So Larry Weingarten looked up a, that book that night and was able to find an original copy from the 1941 publication series, which he acquired. Um, he has since uh, given it to Jim Lutz, who's also in the hot water business um, out here in California. And Larry found another copy for me for my library that someone in India is publishing. It's not the big size book. It's really small. And I can't read the numbers in it. It's too tiny. But nonetheless, the book is there and the research is there. And is it is because of that um, that uh, we have started to do research on modern re the pressure loss through modern pipe and fittings. And we set up a lab to measure it ourselves. And now we have numbers and you can use them for design. So the one of the common pushbacks that we get from plumbers when we talk about going to smaller diameter pipes is, is that we're not going to have enough water at the X, Y, and Z car wash shower head that the client has picked. Can you explain a little bit about whether or not that's a, a realistic concern or why not? Sure. So we have to work backwards for this problem. First of all, um, out how to describe this there is nothing anywhere in the codes that say you can't have a deluge shower some programs in some states and some recommendations say you shouldn't ought to do it and most of us can't afford to do it so it doesn't happen okay uh, i worked out the math a couple of years ago for the, the doe testimony i gave and i think it costs an extra 10 grand to build that shower compared to the base shower. And okay, if you wanna do it, I, I'm not gonna stop you, okay? I don't agree with it, but I'm gonna tell you how to get hot water quickly to that system too. Um, the, con the dilemma, um, how to describe this? The dilemma we face is that you have to start with the flow rate that you're attached to. So how many gallons per minute have to move through the valve? That's the first question I'd want to know. I know Kohler makes a shower valve, an electronic shower valve that can move 20 gallons a minute through it. So the pipe that's attached to it has to be able to carry 20 gallons a minute, doesn't it? If you put in a master tub, a soaker tub that's got 100 gallons in it that you use however often you use it, you want to put a big pipe in so it can fill sometime today, not next week. Right, you want it to work properly. And so my rule is to work, things have to work properly, then be efficient doing it, okay? And so working backwards from the fixture, if that's the desire to put it in the building, then you should put the piping in that supports its ability to work properly. Does that mean you might have to upsize the rest of the piping all the way back to the water heater? Yeah. If I were thinking hard about that house, um, I'd consider figuring out how to locate the water heater really close to that shower, right? Or maybe create a separate zone from the water heater for that shower so that it's not affecting the plumbing of the rest of the house. 
Because if you put a 20 gallon per minute shower on a typical three quarter inch pipe, you're gonna stress out the rest of the house. Okay. And so we have to think about it as a zoning question is how do we create an effective, useful zone for that purpose? And then size all the plumbing properly and still deliver hot water efficiently and effectively. They work, we work backwards from the fixtures, not the other way around. So I don't fight the pipe diameter question that way. I look at it the other way and say, what's the right size for the job at hand? On the we other just, side of this. We, we just went ahead, through this ben. exact situation because we, we have one of those Kohler DTV valves that flows 21 gallons per minute for a client. And there's it, body washes and rain heads and yeah. yada, yada, yada. And so the way we ended up solving it after, you know, a lot of back and forth on the job site is, is we put the Sanco heater uh, four feet underneath the shower in the crawl space because it was the only way that we were able to comply with the jurisdiction's requirements for the uh, contained volume of hot water in the piping system. Right. So. Right. And so, it right, that you have to get very creative. Um, and the contained volume in the piping system is an interesting metric. Um, we want it to be as small as practical, but I'm not sure limiting it helps anybody much. Yeah. Um, I know we can do it as an, a, a logic exercise and we can get very creative in construction. Um, but if we want to do it as part of a, a requirement, we have to start teaching people how to get the relationships between the sources of hot water and the fixtures right. Uh, the, well, not to go down a rabbit hole, one of my pushbacks to that kind of approach is, is that it should be taking in the efficiency of the hot water generating device, because if this is a supposedly uh, a way of controlling energy consumption on a municipal level, then, you know, 82% uh, uh, efficient hot water boiler should be getting a penalty versus a COP3 or 4 heat pump hot water heater. So it's like... You know, and you have these conversations with the municipal people in charge of the energy raters, and they're like, "Well, yeah, sure, but it's hard to do." Yeah, that. <laughs> they they we tend not to think comprehensively about this problem. Um, I used to work for state government here in California, and um, we didn't always think comprehensively about a solution set. We needed something because someone was yelling at us, and so we came up with the first thing we could think of. Um, sometimes it wasn't the best thing. Um, and once it's in, once it's codified, it's really hard to change things like that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Kat, Kathy Spitzfersi Spitz has, I think, an appropriate question. How do you z zone the plumbing, especially, you know, or, or she, 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 she's designing a master bath or with a soaking tub? Do you do uh, uh, home runs for everything? Do you, or is your trunk and branch and twig, does that, does that feed the whole bathroom? So um, to Kathy's specific question, if the master bath edition has a standard soaking tub with a three quarter inch or smaller valve, then I think you can design it as one zone for the bathroom because it's all going in the same direction. The question is, because I'm going to guess there's also a master shower in there and one or two sinks. Um, that's a typical master bath edition. And so I'm also going to guess it's 30 or 50 feet or more away from the water heater just because, right? Remember that one room, we get 30 feet to go across one room. And so unless we got very lucky, it's likely to go back to the original water heater. And if you're talking about long runs, you may as well just have one of them in this case. If everything can be done in three quarter inch pipe, that's what I do. Um, did pretty good guessing, didn't I, Kathy? <laughs> um, but this is, you know, this is pretty typical. So I would design it with a loop that runs from the water heater to the master suite. And I would go, the branch can be close to the water source of the beginning of where the water heater is. It sort of depends what else is on the way, but that's what I would think about. Um, assuming it's off in another direction than the rest of the house, uh, up and over or outside somewhere. Um, so then you go from that point out to the master bathroom, you loop around to the bathroom, you don't have to get as close to the tub as you do to the showers and the sinks because they use less water per minute, um, right? And you want the hot water to get there quickly for those. So the twigs are short for that. You can have a somewhat longer th twig for the soaker tub, but if you can make it short for everybody, go ahead and do it. Um, the beginning of the return on that loop starts right after the branch to the last fixture in the bathroom. 
So if it, you know, tip, I don't know what the floor plan looks like, but it's not untypical to route outbound um, past the shower, past the tub, turn around and come back past the two sinks and head back to, to the water heater. That's a pretty typical loop layout. But whatever it is, it is. The return for that pipe begins after the branch to the last sink in that description. Okay, the pump can go back at the water heater or you could pop it up under the sink, that last sink, right? You put the, the pipe there and the pump there and that would control the when the pump turned on and off, everything would be inside the envelope. There's a couple of ways of doing that. Remember, you're making a circle. Question is, where does the circle begin and end? And I want the temperature sensor as close to the sink in the last fixture in the bathroom as possible so that I don't inadvertently heat more of the, the return line than I have to. I don't need to heat the return. There's no fixtures on it. And I see a question from Brian. Yes, I'd still put a dedicated hot water return pipe back to the water heater. Um, I prefer to do that. I like to keep the hot with the hot and the cold with the cold. The only time they get to meet is at a fixture. Um, it's generally safer plumbing and less confused if something goes wrong. It's easier to diagnose. Um, in the construction of the plumbing, under the assumption that we're using uh, PEX with insert fittings, which is pretty typical these days, I want to minimize the number of fittings, particularly elbows in the network. Starting from the mechanical room, I usually use, plumb the mechanical room in copper and brass with threaded fittings so I can take things apart and union so I can undo things and repair stuff because that's where we're going to do the work. I hate having to come in and cut the pipe that's one month old. So unscrew some stuff and we can be done in an hour instead of a month. Right, let's get this thing over with. We will make mistakes. We will have to do service and maintenance. So I plan on making it easy for that to happen. But once I leave the mechanical room, say it's I'm going up to the ceiling with my copper and brass stuff, I then connect to the PEX for the long, the long runs. Um, if I have to make a hard 90 turn, I do it in copper because the pressure loss per elbow is much less than it is in plastic. That's a hard 90, right? That kind of a 90, right? The really sharp ones like that. Um, if you have even a small curve in the elbow, you're better off. But if it's an insert elbow, it eats up the waterway and that's problematic for, for pressure loss and things. So I prefer to use copper to make the turns unless I can bend the pipe. If I can less, bend the less... PEX pipe. Less so on like crimped uh, PEX 90s? No, no. doesn't matter. All, all, all insert 90s are not as good as not insert 90s. <laughs> um, and so uh, I've got data for this and I'll happily do another one. We can share it. We probably ought to write up an article just on that um, because what we've, we have 70 different combinations of pipe and fittings for half and three-eighths well, tubing. That's, that's like one of the hot like uh, banters between the plumbers now is like, oh, I do crimp on and I do expansion. Well, yours is better, this and that and the other thing. It's like, it, does it really matter? Yes, it does. But I don't want any 90 degree elbows. The correct answer is there are no 90 degree elbows in PEX fittings, in PEX. You don't do hard 90s. Zero is a good number. Okay, you make all of your turns with long radius sweeps. You can bend uh, PEX piping and use bend supports to keep it neat and straight. That's acceptable because there's no pressure loss other than the length of the pipe. Everything else adds to the length of the pipe with additional pressure loss. It gets worse with three eighths than it is by a lot when compared to what it is at, at half inch and half inches worse than three quarter in pressure loss just because their inside diameters are smaller, right? So my rule is no elbows, but you have to allow for T's and you have to allow for couplings at the end to get it into the, the angle stops. So there have to be T's to get out of the trunk, right? A trunk goes to a twig, a twig goes to a fixture. There's a beginning and end of every twig. Twigs should have no 90 degree elbows in them, neither should the trunks. OK, if you have to put in 90s, they should they end up being in the mechanical room or by lack of good planning at the other end. And I'm a firm believer that good planning helps. And so if I was doing construction, I'd be working with my framer to make sure that 
I have the correct spacing of the supports in the bathtub area so that the plumber's job is easy to do, not hard to do. You're talking about two studs. Give me a break. Come on. There's six ways to solve that problem, which make it easy to work on and about a hundred ways to do it wrong. Let's find the ones that work right. Who's those? Um, I usually just have an angry plumber with a sawzall on the first day of rough in. That's typically how it goes in my world. No matter what I ask. Right. And, You've been framing right. in the way. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, would, I, would, I have found that um, buying breakfast for a couple of people and walking through the job might be a really smart way to avoid sawzall land. Um, we don't do it often enough, in my opinion. As far as I can tell, the uh, crews on residential construction are not allowed to talk with each other. Um, in commercial, you tend to see a bit more con more discussion and collegial relations, but on residential construction sites, I think it's illegal to have a conversation with your colleague across the fence. We speak um, to one another. We just complain about each other's work. That's the only communication that's going is the complaining, uh, and that that's about what it's limited to. Yeah, or about their music selections. That's a, a frequent one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. So I see Ian has put in a interesting comment for us. Apart from energy and installation costs, uh, are there any downsides to recirc loop? I have one. It's the best thing ever. So you got to hear tell us what that is. Yeah, you shouldn't include the refrigerator water on the kitchen sink loop. It's tough on the ice maker. That's correct. It's a cold water fixture, not a hot water fixture. Unless, of course, you're in Alaska, in which case the toilets probably ought to be connected to the hot water side of the system. A rather luxurious experience if you've ever been on one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It was the summer. I didn't get to experience it much. Um, Is there, Gary, do you know anything about, uh, we keep seeing these uh, smart recirc pumps being suggested to us that use machine learning or so on and so forth to learn people's use habits in order to anticipate when they're going to need hot water. Do you have any thoughts on whether or not those are actually effective approaches? So I have a question for you. Did you have a normal week last week? I did. Sure. I got a call on Tuesday that told me I had to be out of town early on Wednesday. That was not in my plan, but it happens on a fairly regular basis. So the pattern of use you had on Tuesday and the previous week, Wednesday and Thursday, isn't going to be true this week on Wednesday and Thursday because you're going to be out of town, right? You're not going to use hot water in your shower first thing in the morning because you won't be there. The smart systems have no way of telling that. They do what they've learned. So the learning it needs to be interruptible when change is in the air. And my observation of having interviewed over 50,000 people in the last 30 years is that hot water use patterns vary in households daily. Yes, we have typical patterns and yes, it's reasonably similar. It is never identical. And so given that the machine learns the, 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 the bandwidth of what's typical and it makes sure you have hot water for the whole bandwidth. Well, that's nice. What if it picks the bandwidth as two hours and you're actually, but you only need hot water for 10 minutes in that whole period, right? So I'm not sure I think they're very, they sort of do what they say they're going to do and they mean consumers don't have to interact with them very well, but it's not my preference for installation. Uh, from I, like to, I like to tell the, tell the pump to operate when I want it to. Yeah, from the builder's perspective, I've always been very anxious about them because we have to comply with temp to rise or volume uh, measurements to meet our local energy standards. Uh, and to me, it's like, how am I going to train this thing before the radar shows up so that I get it to perform? You can't. So yeah, we you have, have, and it takes a couple of weeks. And, yeah. You, you go on vacation, it's all it's all screwy again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Motion sensors or, or, um, or buttons. Yeah, so motion sensor in the toe kick means if you don't put your foot under the toe kick, it won't know. You have to put your foot there. It's an intentional activity without pushing a button, but it's knowing where the button is. Um, another one is a, a, a button on a wall plate. Um, I'm personally fond of um, having buttons next to alarm clocks. And someday we'll have the buttons in the phone, if you will. We'll be able to tell the phone to turn on the, yeah, the pump to make it start. 
The key then is how do you turn it off? What's We know how to tell it to turn on. Um, I don't know about you, but um, I don't usually shower until after the alarm goes off. But it takes a finite amount of time for me to get out of bed and get to the toilet and get ready to shower, right? There's a certain set of morning routines that I do that take time. What I used to do is get out of bed, stumble to the shower, turn it on, and then go to the toilet. Now I can get out of bed, press the button on my way to the toilet. When I'm done there, hot water's in the shower. Same basic routine, same amount of time, if you will, but the water didn't run down the drain. The energy didn't run down the drain. By the way, remember the extra water, that two to one relationship? All of that water started in the water heater. So the extra ran down the drain. That's the energy waste attached to the water waste. Getting the volume smaller in the whole pipe network means that there's less energy to, re to reheat on a daily basis because all pipes will eventually cool down every day, many more than once. An earlier question about drain waste heat recovery. Um, I saw that. Yep. It, it generally, do you find those to be effective? Any tips or tricks to how to deploy those if they are effective and make them effective? Yeah, don't spread the showers all across the house. Uh, it, look, you're spending, figure you're spending $500 to $1,000 to install a nice piece of copper to copper heat exchange. Right. That's the what we're building today. We want it to be vertical because it minimizes the total length that we need to have. There's some new I new ones. Keep people keep telling me they got a new one that works better. Well, when I see it, I'll tell you about it. Um, but the idea is that it's a, a counterflow heat exchanger. They're reasonably efficient as long as the water sticks to the pipe, which it mostly does, but not entirely. And it picks up on a if you've designed it properly, it'll pick up half the temperature difference, maybe a bit more between what's coming in and what's coming down. Okay, so imagine what's coming in is 60 and what's coming down is 100 and you pick up half of the 40 degree difference, you'll add 20 degrees to the cold side of the system. All make sense? Mm -hmm. Remember it starts out cold. So it has to warm up at the beginning of the shower. If showers are eight minutes long, which is a US national average, um, the first two minutes are warming everything up. So the first two minutes are getting some benefit, but not 20 degree benefits, right? Everything's trying to warm up. And then you're taking the rest of the shower using it and you get six minutes of benefit. Well, it's a number. It's great. That's one shower. Americans take less than one, American adults take less than one shower per person per day on average. So all right, if there's only one shower is being shared by two people and you only, and that's the only shower that's attached to that drain water heat recovery device, that's all you're gonna get. If it's shared by 10 people, right? Or four people or whatever the magic number is, then you get more value for your dollar and it provides more total benefit. So when we have architectural floor plans that are eight miles apart between the wet rooms, then we have a problem. We want more than one of these devices. Great. Where's the water heater? I don't know. Somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide how you're going to get the benefit out. And um, it's always less than is claimed. Temperatures are not quite what we expect. Delta T's aren't quite what we expect. The efficiency isn't quite what we expect. Um, but longer length and bigger surface area give you a better chance of getting more out of it. And sure, if you're in a situation where the cost of energy is incredibly high and those BTUs saved may add up, then sure, it might be a, a viable approach. It, look, it's, a, it's not moving. There's no moving parts. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a very long payout thing. Mm -hmm. um, or we had an interesting question earlier from Melissa. In, in multifamily centralized CO2 refrigerant hot water systems, they don't like recirculation loops apparently what do you, you know what do you recommend for those systems we're doing mm -hmm. retrofit right most of our work is for look 90% 99% of all buildings ever built were built at the end of today in fact 100% were built at the end of today tomorrow we start the new ones right 
So new is a small number relative to the existing population of buildings. Always has been, except for the very beginning. And since we're not at the very beginning, it's been true for our working lives. So most of our work is going to be in retrofit. And most of our work is going to be in buildings that didn't have well-planned layouts to have efficient hot water delivery. Right? So we're going to have recirc loops or some other temperature maintenance system in multifamily buildings. There's only two temperature maintenance strategies I'm aware of. One is circulation loops. The other is electric heat trace. Electric heat trace will play well with heat pump water heating because it's not sending warm water back to the water heater to be reheated. Do you Whether explain, it's a, Gary, what, what the issue is with sending warm water back to a CO2 heat pump? Do any of you remember installing high 90% uh, condensing gas water heaters? I have it. <laughs> So not that long ago, we were promoting 90% condensing gas water heaters because they're really efficient. They have a similar problem. As you get closer to the condensing, the maximum temperature of condensing happening in the plumbing, the water heater gets less and less efficient. It's never worse than its theoretical minimum, which is 75%, but it's not 90 something percent, which is what you thought you were buying. It also creates the, any condensate that is created is very acidic and wears out the, the parts of the machine, right? It's not working as quite as intended. Um, so in heat pump water heaters, we have a similar problem, but with the refrigerant gases. The refrigerant gases don't like to see hot water. The delta T is too small for them to work against well. And so they get less efficient as they get closer to the finishing point. And if you start out at 105 or more in the return, and, and if you're following ASHRAE 188 guideline 12, because you're concerned about Legionella in your building, that bottom end is 120 degrees. The top end has to be 140 or less. That's the way that the, the, the rules work for plumbing in these buildings. So you only have a 20 degree window to play in, and you're already at the top end of the system. It's trying to put out 140 to 150 degree water. Well, you're making it work hard. So it will work. It's just a, not a happy with you at all. Um, the strategy that most delta for the phase change to be most efficient. That's correct. And and the, as best I can tell, the pump itself is working harder because the compression the, the the pressures in the system are higher, and so it's basically putting strain on the machine itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we tend to do in those situations is to figure out how to add something like a swing tank to manage the circulation loop losses separately from the bulk hot water heating. And then you, you know, you run those with resistance, at least for whatever is needed. And you don't let the heat pump see hot, cold water. You let it see the coldest cold water it can get, which is the incoming water from outside the bottom of the bulk tank, if you will. Or, 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 or earlier, Allison mentioned that in Atlanta, their their incoming cold water is seventy five degrees. Is 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 that warm enough to affect uh, the efficiency of, of that of of, of, a, of a of a refrigerant system? Yes, but they can't complain about incoming cold water temperature, can we? <laughs> <laughs> we can complain about what we do afterwards. Sure. Um, and so, uh, I mean, let's. Al Allison's got pretty warm cold water, but so does Phoenix, right? Um, actually, so does Indianapolis. Uh, depending on where you are, the pipes run from the river underground a ways and near the surface, they start to warm up and they're significantly different from the river if your building's near the river than if your building is 20 miles away. Hmm. Um, it, it, like 20 or 30 degrees. The, the ground warms it up rather dramatically compared to what oh. it started as. Um, and so incoming cold water temperatures, you know, are what you get to start with. Um, Brian's got a good comment about um, how to use drain water heat recovery, um, grouping things together that can share the same resource. So think of the second floor, uh, don't assume basements, think of a, the, the second floor uh, showers, right? In an apartment building or in a hotel. 
there's always back to back in hotels. They're pretty smart. They don't do door to door construction. They do back to back, which minimizes the number of risers, right? So all that stack shares the same plumbing. And if you could capture the waste heat from that stack in groups of two to four apartments at a time, you'd be in good shape hmm. without Sorry. getting into complicated systems that would sit somewhere else in the building, like the basement, which I don't assume we always have. Okay. Yeah. Well, G um, Gary, I think, I think we could continue learning from you and asking questions all, all evening long, but uh, we should probably wrap things up. Um, do you have any, any last thoughts you want to leave everybody with? Any uh, quips or advice or warnings? Resources. Resources. So people have been putting resources in the chat. Um, and I, you know, I, my website has a bunch of stuff. There's some videos on that website where you can see what I've done before. There's some really good articles that have been written, some of them on the website, others elsewhere. Um, the biggest thing I want to share with people now as a takeaway for today is that there is a new way of sizing the water piping in buildings. The rules for pipe sizing hot water and cold water distribution systems in our buildings were published in 1940 by a fellow named Roy Hunter, who worked with the National Bureau of Standards back then, which we now call NIST, okay, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Even though flush volumes and flow rates have gone down every decade since, we have not changed the numbers in the method of sizing. IATMO, the in International Association of Plumbing and Mechanical Officials has a committee called the Water Efficiency and Sanitation Standard Committee that developed a new method of right sizing the, the peak flow rate based on modern information or residential applications. It is applicable to single family, single dwelling unit and multifamily buildings, okay? It's available for use as a standard out of WeStand. If you type in IATMO water demand calculator, you will find the website. Um, and you can download articles and how to use it and a spreadsheet so you can start playing with it tonight. Um, it's applicable to re all residential applications that look like where we live, dwelling units and apartment buildings. It's not yet available for hotels, even though that looks a lot like residential. We just haven't finished the math. So I want to encourage you to start learning about the water demand calculator, um, which is what we call it. It's available as part of the Uniform Plumbing Code uh, as Appendix M, as in Mary, to the UPC, if you're in a UPC jurisdiction. Um, if you're in an IPC jurisdiction, you can use it based on the clause that's in Chapter 6 that says the design of the the distribution system is up to the engineer and the engineer must use acceptable methods. And this is follows the acceptable method route. We used it first for apartment buildings in upstate New York in 2020, we got a project to work on and um, we changed the plumbing size from uh, a three inch main, this is a 35 unit apartment building, right? One bathroom per apartment, shared laundry on one on each floor. No big deal, right? A three inch main and a prediction of 70 gallons per minute at peak. When we did the right sizing using Appendix M, we were able to bring the main pipe size down to one and a quarter inches because the prediction of peak flow was only 14 or 15 gallons a minute. They didn't have a lot of available pressure at the street. So we had to keep the pipe size big enough so everything would work. But hey, we went down four, three or four pipe sizes. That's like a pretty big deal. And everybody said some version of that's not gonna work. So we actually built a mock-up before we went to construction and made sure we'd have enough residual pressure to run the apartments. And we did, so we went ahead and built it. Um, uh, the, the design engineers won an award for my ATMO this year, uh, the President's Green Oval Award for being the first in the country to use the design in multifamily. Um, it's a pretty big deal. So I want that's one thing I want to leave you with is that we now have some tools for right sizing. Um, you should try it. Try it. Look at your own house. Just start with the simple stuff. 
um, and then start using it, you'll see huge benefits. Um, what we found, by the way, is it saves somewhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars in first costs per apartment. Wow! If you do the architectural compactness stuff we talked about with the, the hot water rectangle, um, single story slab on grade, you save one to two thousand dollars in first cost per home. All in horizontal pipe, right? It's not the vertical stuff. It's saving the horizontal stuff. It's a big deal. And most of that savings, by the way, is labor. It's almost a week of labor to do less work, which is mm. a good deal, given that it's hard to find people to do any work at all. So I think that's enough for tonight. Yeah, excellent. Hey, cool. Hey, thank you very much for joining us, Gary, and being being generous with your knowledge as always. And Yeah. Yes, thank you all for coming. Questions were good. I like good questions. Um, is there any way to fix Emma's 15 minute heat up time for her shower? <laughs> yes, there is. Um, so, uh, Emma, if you know how to find me. I'll type it in. And uh, there is something I'll she can do as long as she doesn't tell the owner. <laughs> <laughs> There was a fair bit of uh, information shared in the chat box tonight. I'm dropping my email in there. I've saved the chat. If anybody would like a copy of the chat, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'm happy to share that. Uh, ben, you have yeah. to select everyone. Oh, ah, look. <laughs> look. I'm guilty of the same thing. <laughs> uh, I have done it as well. Yeah. All right. That's good. Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to do this. I'm happy to continue doing them. There's lots much more to share. Um, Excellent. Well, we'll have you back for sure then. Good night, Nicole.